I am Heinrich von Staden, Professor Emeritus of Classics and History of Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton in the United States. This conference is about commentaries, but the commentaries are very diverse sorts. Can you tell us a little bit about the commentaries that you study, in particular, who wrote them, when and where were they written, why were they written, and what do they look like physically? Are they fragmentary? What materials are they written on? What kind of script? How are they transmitted? Okay, I work on uh, commentaries on technical texts, mainly medical texts, but also some ast astronomical. And uh, these commentaries were written beginning in the third century BCE. And I look at the ones written all the way until about the fifth century and sixth century of the Common Era. They uh, were uniform in some respects, but in others they differed greatly. The source material I have is to some extent complete commentaries, quite a number of these, and others uh, are extant only in very, very fragmentary form, some more fragmentary than others. Uh, so they were written uh, many of these in Alexandria, some in Rome, some in the western cities of the, in what's now Turkey, in Asia Minor in other words, and some in Egypt. Uh, very few survive on the original material on which most were written, namely papyrus, but we do have some papyrus fragments of uh, ancient commentaries. Most were written on papyrus then, but a few also on parchment. However, they come to us, for the most part, written on paper. Written on paper, that is, in a much later period. So they were, the paper copies were produced from parchment copies or from papyrus copies in rare cases, but mainly from, from paper copies. Uh, so does that begin to answer? That begins to answer, and it suggests another question that might be important for understanding how important this tradition is, which is, how often would these have had to have been copied to give them a chance of surviving so that scholars today could study them? They would have had to be copied many times over many generations. And some of them were copied by copyists who didn't really understand what they were copying. And others are in very good shape from that point of view. They seem to, seems to have been some professional expertise behind some of the copies. But so we're essentially dealing with copies of copies of copies. And this is true for much ancient literature, as you undoubtedly know, not only for the commentaries. But the commentaries that I work on, that is the commentaries on medical texts, had an extraordinary rate of survival, whether fragmentary or complete, for the reason that they were regarded as useful to the practice of medicine. And that is a difference between them and some of the literary and the philosophical commentaries, that these actually could be a matter, to put it in an extreme form, of life and death. Because matter, medicine deals with matters of life and death. Uh, so uh, I think we could say that it's extraordinary to what extent medical commentary survived, particularly those by Galen and those on Galen. So this suggests that this information, even when copied by people who were ignorant of the contents, was considered very precious. And precious not only in the already extremely long period that you're covering, but for at least a mill millennium thereafter. Yes. Some of them, of course, also survived uh, in more than one language. And so some of the commentaries I deal with are no longer extant in the original Greek in which they were written, but are extant in Arabic form. And of a few, we also have Syriac fragments. But the uh, Arabic versions of these com commentaries, where we have the original Greek as well as the Arabic, the Arabic versions turn out to be extremely accurate 
translations of the Greek. These translations were made in 9th century Baghdad in what's now Iraq, probably by a Christian scholar, uh, came from the Christian Syriac community and translated them first into Syriac and then into, into Arabic, uh, Hunayn ibn Ishaq. There were others involved in the so-called translation movement as well, but that is crucial, crucial avenue of access for us to some of the commentaries that no longer survive in the Greek. So this polyglot chain of transmission suggests that the intellectual community that preserved these commentaries and perhaps in many cases elaborated upon them was not only a community that stretched over centuries but over very wide geographical areas and many cultures as well. We have some commentaries in Latin, Latin as well, from late antiquity, from the early Middle Ages, uh, particularly commentaries on uh, treatises like the Hippocratic Aphorisms, which enjoyed enormous popularity in uh, different epochs. Yes, there's, a, there's really a trans-epochal community of readers, not only transgenerational, but transepochal and transnational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it, we live in an age which is absolutely obsessed with new knowledge, with innovation, indeed with disruptive innovation. Um, we barely encounter in a scientific article, a medical article for example, to take an analogous case here in the Lancet or the New England Journal of Medicine, a footnote that refers to literature that's more than 10 years. Um, perhaps exceptionally the first instance of a case uh, long ago will be noted, but the time scale of these commentaries and the imaginary of the community that so carefully preserve them is one which I think is very foreign to our current idea about valid, useful knowledge. Can you say something more about the implicit ideal of knowledge that the commentary tradition cherished and was built upon? Yes, I'd be happy to try. This is a very complex subject. But uh, first of all, let me say that the, the ancient commentators uh, differed to some extent as far as their goals are concerned. It was, they didn't all have the goal merely of preserving old authority and elucidating old authority, interpreting old authority to keep it useful to community, a community of readers, a community of practitioners, a community of teachers and students. But they also, in many cases, added new knowledge in the commentaries. Let me, give, let me take a very simple example, but a very important one. The body described by multiple authors in the Hippocratic Corpus is almost invariably a body without nerves. It's a nerveless body because the nerves had not been discovered at the time that most of these uh, original treatises were written. By the time of the earliest commentators, in other words, 3rd century BC, the nerves had been discovered. And by the time of Galen, in the 2nd century of the Common Era, that knowledge of the nerves and of the nervous system had expanded greatly. Galen is aware that Hippocrates, on whom he wrote many commentaries, 12 of which survive, did not know of these nerves. So he tells us about the nerves and the relevance of the nerves for treating certain conditions. So he adds new knowledge. And at times he will overtly criticize Hippocrates. In part, this is a matter of showing, I think this is a hidden plot really in the commentaries because I think some of these commentaries do have plots and the uh, subterranean plot, so to speak, is to establish himself not only as the new Hippocrates, but also as a much better informed Hippocrates, one who understands the anatomy of the entire body far better than Hippocrates ever did thanks to his many dissections of rhesus monkeys and barbary apes, 
Although I never dissected a human corpse. It's another story entirely. <laughs> but he also understood other things much better. I just cite the nerves because that's a very striking mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. Where we went from a nerveless body to a nerved body in the third century. One could imagine that commentary traditions thrive where information is scarce, where every nugget of, especially information, observational information about materia medica, about which drugs do or do not work, or about individual variability in the phenomenological profile of a disease, all of that could so easily be lost with the death of the experienced clinician. One wonders whether or not in an epoch like ours, in which we use phrases like data deluge, uh, whether we might have the same anxieties which clearly fueled and supported the commentary tradition for so many centuries, that anxiety that precious information might be lost. Um, I'm sure some people have that anxiety. Uh, you know, I'm just a tourist in the 21st century. I really live in antiquity. I know antiquity. what you mean. I'm an innocent <laughs> bystander in the 21st century, right? Uh, <laughs> so I don't know that much about contemporary anxieties if, uh, concerning loss. Uh, I would like to pick up on your, your comment of the, about the precious data. I think that's particularly true in a discipline like medicine, where people are dealing not with heavenly bodies that recurrently behave in the same fashion, but are dealing with a human body. And there was deep awareness already in antiquity, and it grew over time, that hu human bodies differ from one another. I'm referring not only to body types, but that there's an almost infinite variety of bodies and each of these bodies is almost inf infinitely, in infinitely variable. That is, it can change from T1 to T2, and change from one moment to another moment, and therefore behave differently in different respects. So every bit of information we can get <laughs> about this enormous variety of human bodies is very valuable, because perhaps the body that we are observing here as doctors now in the 16th century or whenever, uh, will find a counterpart in one of these ancient records of observation. Of course, it's an enormous record of observation. That seems as true now as it was in the 5th century BCE. Well, Thank you very think. much. <laughs> My pleasure. My great pleasure.